is Israel or Jacob? Israel or Jacob? I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 32, first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 32, let's all stand up please for the reading of God's word. Israel or Jacob? Genesis chapter 32, we're going to read verses 24 right through to verse 28. And Jacob was left alone. Now remember, he was going back to the land of Canaan, and his brother Esau was coming out to meet him with 400 armed men to kill him. And Jacob had sent his wife, both of his wives, uh, Leah and Rachel, with their families ahead. And then Jacob stayed at the uh, brook Jabuk, uh, and he stayed there, and he ended up wrestling with God, as we will see. So it says, Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the break of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, that is, this extraordinary man was the pre-incarnate Christ, by the way. He said, let me go, for the day breaketh. The morning's coming. I don't want you to look at me. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. That is, it means the face of God, because he even says it. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, that is the face of God. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. When I was a young man, my grandmother, God bless her soul, when it would thunder out, she say in Portuguese, Jesus ta falon com ti. In other words, Jesus is speaking to you. And she always taught me, if you ever looked on the face of God, you'd die. You know that's Bible? Because that's the beatific vision we're going to see someday when we're glorified. Amen? All righty. Israel or Jacob, let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord God, as we stand in the sanctuary on the Sabbath day. Lord, we've come here to worship you. That's why you call us to, on the Sabbath, to corporately come here and worship and learn from the Word of God. And Father, I pray that you'd anoint this preacher. You bring all things to my remembrance, and I can bless your people, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Abraham's son Isaac and his wife Rebekah had two twin boys, and their names were, of course, Esau and Jacob. Esau means red. In other words, Esau, when he was born, he was very ruddy looking. He had, and, and matter of fact, the Bible says he was very hairy as a baby. Whereas the name Jacob means trickster. It means supplanter. It means deceiver. And it perfectly and properly fits Jacob's duplicative character. Why, Pastor Joel? Because Jacob had stolen his brother Esau's birthright. He had stolen his blessing as the firstborn son. Firstborn son was to get 50% of the inheritance from his father. The rest was divvied up amongst all the rest of the family. And beloved, he had stole his inheritance. And therefore Esau utterly hated Jacob. He uh, planned to kill Jacob as soon as his father Isaac had died. But when Jacob's mother, Rebekah, learned of Esau's plot and plan to murder him, she told her husband Isaac, and consequently, they immediately sent Jacob to go to a faraway place known uh, from Bathsheba to go to a place called Pandanaran in Haran. And so they said, I want you to go there, and you have an uncle. His name is Uncle Laban. He lives in Haran, some 600 miles away. Now remember, he's not taking a train there, he's not taking a bus there, he's not taking a plane there, so this was quite a trip that he had to make, amen? 600 long miles. So there, Jacob met his match, an old Uncle Laban, who was just as deceitful as he was. Yet in spite of everything, God still blessed Jacob for his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac's sake, the patriarchs. And Jacob ended up living in Haran with his uncle Laban for 20 years, beloved. He got married there. He got rich there. But now God had told him, it's time for you to go back to Beersheba in the land of Canaan. And so, beloved, here we pick up the story of Jacob's homecoming as he prepares to meet his hostile brother Esau. Esau learns that Jacob is coming home. Esau takes 400 armed troops and he goes after his brother Jacob. 
I'm going to kill him. What he did to me, how he stole my blessing, my birthright, my inheritance, I'm going to kill him. So you can just see him uh, frothing at the bit, waiting to end up meeting with Esau. Now, beloved, 20 years have passed since he's, uh, his brother Esau has seen him. 20 years have passed, and Jacob deeply fears that Esau has never let go of that long uh, hatred and grudge against them. And the scripture teaches he had not until God had changed Esau's heart on the way to go kill Jacob. God directly intervened. And that's why I tell you how important intercessory prayer is. Because you activate the Holy Spirit in a person's life when he goes to work. Would you say amen? And that's what happened. Jacob was praying, oh Lord, oh Lord, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. And God changed Esau's heart on that trip to meet him. But the night before he meets Esau, beloved, with his 400 armed men, he also wrestles with a man. And this is no ordinary man, this is an extraordinary man. In theology, we call this a Christophany. What did I say it was called? A Christophany. It means, beloved, it was a pre-incarnate appearance and manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that Jesus was the rock that followed Israel. So this, the person who he wrestled with, was no one less than Jesus, who was God in the flesh. So then, beloved, the, when this match, this wrestling match, Jesus and him are wrestling back and forth, and you can see Jacob trying to pin Jesus, and of course Jesus is kind of letting him go through it, you know, and going, going through all this, and Jesus pretending that he can't get away from him, and finally the light started dawning. It started, the night started fading, the light started dawning, and Jesus said, I've got to end this before daytime, because if you see my face, you're going to die, boy. <laughs> So he touches the inside of his thigh, and Jews to this day won't eat that inner sin, uh, sin, oh, by the way. They honor this. So he touches the inside of Jacob's thigh, and now Jacob, his thigh is out of joint, and he's limping. He limped the rest of his life, and I'll talk more about that as we go along. But you see, beloved, not only did God wrestle with Jacob, and Jacob wrestled with God, but the Bible says God then changed his name from Jacob the deceiver to Israel meaning the prince who prevails with both God and with man. Ultimately, the name Israel means those who were ruled by God. Would you say amen? So God also providentially changed Esau's heart, and now when they saw each other, you can just see this scene, beloved. They warmingly and weepingly met each other, and the Bible says they kissed and they hugged. I'm so glad to see you. I can just see Jacob like this. <laughs> Can't you? <laughs> well, if you was going to hug me, I said, you must have a dagger somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right in the back, right? But see, God had providentially done what God could do because he was going to bring the Messiah through Jacob's loins. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, that's the basic background to this story, which also has a profound meaning for us. Now, I've got to tell you the truth here, because I've said this to you before, but Jacob is not one of my favorite Bible characters. Unlike his brother Esau, Esau was a man's man, a hunter. Ah, I love it outside. I love the wilderness. I love to be out there in nature. But Jacob was a mama's boy. Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob was a trickster who himself ultimately leaped, reaped what he sowed, beloved. And while in Haran, the trickster got tricked by old Uncle Laban. It must have been in the genes, you think? <laughs> I mean, he met his match when he met old Uncle Laban. Now, uh, if any man deserved two names in Scripture, Jacob did. Jacob was two people in one person. Jacob was a dual personality. Jacob, beloved, was a moral and squirrel. A spiritual schizophrenic, so to speak. What do you mean, preacher? Because something supernaturally happened with Jacob when he wrestled with God and that man that night. Jacob now became a saved man. In other words, God now changed his nature and God now changed his name. Amen? And he knocked his hip out of joint, his thigh out of joint, and said, for the rest of your life, you're going to limp. And that limp will remind you how you wrestled with me, how you became a saved man, and how you became a new man with a new nature. Would you say amen out there? How'd you like to do that the rest of your life? That's why they gave circumcision. 
And the Old Testament is a sign of the Old Covenant. Every time a man, and I'm not trying to be filthy, would tinkle, he would be reminded, you know what, i got a covenant with God. <laughs> Abraham got circumcised when he was 90 years old, and they didn't have anesthesia. <laughs> okay, so I won't take that any farther. <laughs> But, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that he was a saved man now, uh, now. He was no longer Jacob the supplanter. He was no longer Jacob the deceiver. He was no longer Jacob the trickster. Now he was Israel. Now he was Prince of God. Now he was one who prevailed with God and with man. He was a man of God now, beloved. So now there are two entirely different aspects to the nature and character of Jacob. One is carnal. The other is spiritual. One is of the flesh. The other one is of the spirit. One is serving God, while the other one is serving the God of this world, namely Satan himself. You see, beloved, there's a Jacob and an Israel uh, in all of us. Now listen to me. Jacob represents the old unsaved man, whereas Israel represents the new and the saved man. Jacob represents the fleshy and fallen man. Whereas Israel represents the regenerated and the spiritual man. Jacob represents the cardinal and the worldly man, whereas Israel represents the holy man. Those who have been sanctified, saved by God. And beloved, that man is now forever blessed and favored by God. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this. That morally and spiritually speaking, Jacob and Israel are two dissimilar and radically different people in one person who are worlds apart before God. The new man is made in the image and likeness of God, and the old man, Jacob, is made in the image and likeness of Adam, who's fallen. You have him in you, if you're here today, and I have him in me. If you're saved today, you have Israel in you also, and if you're not, you don't. Sorry to say, I hope you are, are saved. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this. It was Jacob that was the deceived thief who tricked his nearly blind father Isaac into blessing him. Remember when he put wool on the back of his hands and wool on the back of his neck because when he went for the, the fool his father, he knew that Esau, his brother, was a hairy man and he said he had smooth skin. So, oh, Isaac, his eyes were gone. He didn't have his glasses on that night, I guess, and he couldn't tell. He said, but you know what? Your voice sounds like Jacob, but after I feel you, you feel like Esau. So I'm going to take your word that you're Esau. You see, beloved, it was Jacob that stole his brother Esau's birthright and blessing and took away from him everything that was rightly his as the firstborn son. It was Jacob who fled to pay Danaram, beloved, to his uncle Laban's home in Haran. But on the way one night, the story says that he stopped to sleep. And as he went to sleep, beloved, he took this rock and he put it down for his pillow. And he put his head on it. I would never get a rock for my pillow. I slept outside 16 months when I was in the service. But I never put a rock for my pillow. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> okay. But he dreamed about a ladder. And this ladder, the Bible said, reached up to heaven. Heaven to earth. And he said, when he looked at that ladder, there were angels going up and down that ladder, ascending and descending, going up and down. And when he awoke, he called that place Bethel. Now, what does the word Bethel mean? It means the house of God. This, he says, is the house of God. The New Testament states that the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of Jacob's ladder. Jesus said to his disciples that you will see angels ascending and descending on me. So Jacob, and he says, I'm the real Jacob's ladder. So you can see all the type typology we have here in the scripture. Now, beloved, it was Jacob that fell in love with Rachel, and he worked seven years for his uncle Laban as a dowry for his wife. But it was also Jacob who was tricked by his uncle Laban. He surprisingly, that wedding night, when he was not dark and Laban says I want you to go into the tent with your bride and of course he can't see anything so he goes into the tent with his bride and the morning wakes up and it's not Rachel it's Leah <laughs> and old Uncle Laban says well you know we got a, we've got a tradition around here uh, the firstborn has to be married before the secondborn <laughs> so, Jacob had to work another seven years for Rachel right so Laban really had him right by the throat <laughs> 
You can see, beloved, the Bible says, be sure, be sure, be sure, your sin will find you out. As you sow, you reap, God said. You don't plant corn and grow roses. You don't plant hatred and grow love. You don't plant bitterness and get blessings from God in your life. As you sow, you reap. That's the law of reciprocity. Amen? So, beloved, it was Jacob uh, that conned and cheated his uncle Laban in Iran. And through subterfuge, he became a very rich, rich man off his uncle's herds. And it was Jacob that heard the call of God from heaven. He was in the land of, uh, of Pandanaram, beloved, and Haran. And all of a sudden, God says, Jacob, I want you to pack up your stuff, and I want you to go back into the land of Canaan. Go back to Beersheba. I want you to go back to your family, because we are going to bring the Messiah through you. Now, he didn't say that in those words, but the context shows that, okay? That's the Portuguese version. You ought to read it. It's pretty good. You see, beloved, he says, the promises that I made to your grandfather Abraham and to your father Isaac are going to be fulfilled. But, listen to me now, conversely, it was Israel who prayed all night at the brook Jabbok. It was Israel who wrestled and prevailed with God that fateful night. It was Israel who sought God's forgiveness and mercy and protection from his angry brother Esau that fateful night also. It was Israel who tightly clung to God and he said this, I will not let you go. I will not let thee go until you bless me. I won't let you go till you bless me. Oh, beloved, listen to me now. Every one of us needs to learn how to be as tenacious as Jacob and say to God, when you're praying for something, I will not let you go. I won't let you go until you bless me. Come on and say amen out there. I won't let you go. I won't let you go. I'll keep praying and praying. I'll get a hold of the horns of the altar and I'll shake it and I'll shake it until you answer me, O oh God. You see, beloved, it was Israel who offered to give Esau valuable gifts. <laughs> They're really bribery is what it was. <laughs> gifts of money and jewelry and animals as restitution and amends for his sin of stealing from him. And it was Israel who supernaturally and radically changed into another man, just like us, beloved, when we also get saved after we wrestle with God. That's why Paul said to the church of Corinth, and the Corinthians were perverts. They were the worst kind of people you could imagine. In fact, in biblical days, if you were called a Corinthian, it was like saying the worst four-letter word you could ever say. But yet when they got saved, Paul said to them in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Would you say amen? Jacob was now a new man. From that time forth, everybody called him Israel. But he learned that his long uh, thought to be dead son Joseph was now alive down in Egypt. And he had heard through his other sons that Joseph had risen to be uh, vice regent with Pharaoh down there. He was second in command. And so what did Jacob do? Or Israel do? The Bible says that Israel took a trek down there to go see his long departed son. But when he stood before Pharaoh in that pagan land, God once again, and I, it goes right over when you, unless you really study the story, God once again said, Jacob, Jacob, twice he called him Jacob, not Israel. <laughs> he said, Jacob, Jacob, and you'll understand because he lied before Pharaoh, <laughs> okay? Jacob, Jacob. This reveals that in spite of the fact that for these years or many years he had been called Israel, God saw that he still had some Jacob left in him. And beloved, in spite of the fact that for these many years he had been called a prince with God, he still some had that, some of that old supplanter that was still left in him. And in spite of the fact that for these many years he had been uh, one who had prevailed with God, there was still some of that trickery that was left inside of him. He was Jacob. Jacob. You see, beloved, he's now a dual perso personality. He's now two people in one person, residing in one person, because Jacob is still with him. Although Israel has predominated in him for a long time, there's also Jacob who's still there. Jacob in him is not dead yet. God chooses to call him. God chooses to call us by the name which best suits and resembles the present position and condition of our moral and spiritual character that we're now in. 
Beloved, listen to me. Every Christian is both a Jacob and an Israel. Did you get that? That's why these things are written. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. So we can understand this typology. There's Jacob, the old man, and the old nature that wants to disobey God and do bad that's still in us. And beloved, there's Israel, the new man, the new nature that wants to obey God and do good. So we're all both a Jacob and an Israel, two people and one person. We're all a dual personality. Now I got some bad news for you. You said, what? I got some bad news for you. What's that, preacher? The bad news is this. You're never going to be so sanctified that the Jacob in you is totally dead. Did you hear what I said? You'll never be that sanctified on this side of the veil. That won't happen until you're glorified at the second advent. And when you're glorified, then you'll be morally and spiritually perfected and without sin. And that Adamic nature will be totally erased. We'll just say amen out there. Now listen to me, beloved. Till then, Jacob in you is going to have to constantly and continuously wrestle with God, uh, with the Israel that's in you, beloved, until he learns how Israel in you can now reign supreme over your life and on your heart. A lot of people are always feeding Jacob when they should be feeding Israel in their life. Amen? Amen? You bunch of backsliders, excuse me. Beloved, if you think this is not true, then that's a sign that you're Jacob and not Israel, beloved. That your Jacob in you is presently reigning and refuses to humble himself and admit that truth. That's a sign of that. You'll never be a totally new Israel until you finally see Jesus Christ at the second advent. Beloved, listen to me. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, John said this. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall, uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. In other words, Israel has to be about the business of purifying the Jacob in him. Would you say amen out there? That's the hope that I have of seeing the Lord. So you purify yourself each and every day. And Peter says you do that through submitting yourself to the authority of God and obeying the commandments of God. That's how you purify yourself. You see, what I'm saying to you is this here. Jacob and Israel are in you fighting for the supremacy of your life. Jacob wants you to lose the, your, the fight. Israel says, uh-uh, I want you to win the fight. Beloved, Jacob still loves this evil world system. You know that's true. Jacob still uh, uh, de desires to titillate the flesh. Jacob still wants to disobey God's word, will, and ways, but Israel wants to please God. The Israeli in us wants to be a moral and spiritual Christian that's walking holy with God. The Israel in us wants to obey the commandments of God. But old Jacob's there fighting and kicking and screaming, and he doesn't want it to happen in you. Amen. Isn't that the struggle that we read about in the New Testament? You see, with Israel, we prevail with God like princes at high noon. But yet, like Jacob, the sun is ear set in the evening time of our life, and we walk along, we spiritually limp along, just like Jacob did. You see, folks, with Israel, we forgive and forget all those who offend us. But with Jacob, we hold grudges and rancor against those who offend us, and we refuse, the, bitterly refuse, beloved, to ever forgive them. I'm not going to forgive them. You see what they did to me, I'll never forgive them. Oh, beloved, that's Jacob talking, not Israel. You hear me now, that's the flesh. That's the Adamic nature. And it's being edged on by the God of this evil world system himself. You see, beloved, with Israel, we love getting right with God. But yet, like Jacob, beloved, we resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit to make things right with God. With Israel... We confess and forsake our sins, but yet like Jacob, beloved, we constantly and continuously like being a fan and follower of sin. You know, there are times when Jacob wants to be Israel, and there are times when Israel wants to be Jacob. And there are times when Jacob and Israel don't want to be either one. Did you ever find that in your life? I have. I want to hang up my cleats. <laughs> this is a tough 
cross the bear, Lord, in my life. And so, beloved, all they want to do is be left alone. There are times when both Jacob and Israel cry out like Saul, the Pharisee, did. When he said in Romans chapter 7, when he talked about that struggle before he got saved, he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of his death? Beloved, what does he mean by that? In biblical days, in Rome, if you killed a person, they took the carcass of that dead person and they strapped them onto your back and you had to walk around with them on your back. That foul stench of the decay in flesh, you can just imagine what it was like. You see, beloved, that's how they were trying to put down rebellion in Rome, not be a murderer in Rome. Paul says, when I look at my sin, he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It's like this death of sin is strapped to me and I can't seem to get, uh, uh, get it off me. But then he said, blessed be God, Jesus Christ did. Amen. When he got saved, he became Israel. Or Paul, Saul, of Tarsus. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Do you ever find that there is a constant inner war and struggle going on inside of you between Jacob and Israel? Do you ever find that the old man and the new man are always duking it out in you? Do you ever find uh, that the flesh and the spirit in you are doing constant and continuous spiritual battle all the time? Do you ever find that you're like the old Indian chief that had been led to the Lord and the missionary came back to him and said, listen, you're a new man now. He says, and, and uh, now that you're in Christ, you should be able to obey Christ. A year later, the missionary came back. He said to the Indian chief, he said, how's it going, chief? He says, inside, like two dogs fighting. He says, black dog, white dog. He says, who's winning? He says, the one I feed the most. Ah, huh? He was a smart Indian chief. May have taken your scalp. He was a smart chief. <laughs> yeah, and then you got a wig. You put it in the oven, you got a wigwam. Right. Never mind. But anyways, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that you find that there's a right and wrong in you and there's a good and bad in you. You find that there's a true and false in you and you find that there's a moral and immoral in you. You find there's a carnal part of you, but you also find that there is a spiritual part of you. That's the spiritual battle, amen? You see, folks, there's a Jacob inside you that always wants the preeminence. But thank God, there's also an Israel inside of God's people who want, who's been divinely enabled, empowered, and programmed to have the preeminence over Jacob if we let him. That's the key. That's the key. You know, I remember reading a story one time about a flood down somewhere in the in, down south. Let's say what's going on right now. And this man climbed upon the roof, and the floodwaters came right up. And a guy came with a rowboat, and he said, listen, I've come to help you. I've come to save you. And the guy said, no, no, God's going to save me. So he kept praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. Another guy came along uh, with a helicopter. He says, come on, get on here. I'm going to save you. He said, no, God's going to save me. Well, ultimately, the water rose up, and it killed him. When he stood before God, he said, Lord, I pray that you save me. He said, I sent the boat and the helicopter. You wouldn't get in it. That's what we're like sometimes. God puts it out there for us. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way for you to escape, that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. See, God always makes a way that we can escape. It's whether or not we're going to be a Jacob or an Israel in it. You know, beloved, we Jacobs, like Peter can deny our Lord three times, but then after Pentecost, we Israels can stand up for the Lord like Peter did and then win 3,000 souls for Christ. And we Jacobs, like Elijah, can run from Jezebel and all the Jezebels in this life, but then, like Israel, beloved, uh, and like Elijah did, we can defeat the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You see, beloved, we uh, Jacobs, like Jonah, can run from the will of God, but then the Jonah can turn around because he's in Israel right now, and now he can go back and do the will of God. You see that dual personality? And God had to send a, a, a great fish, the Bible says. And you know, it's amazing because I was reading something in True Science about many, many people have been swallowed by whales. You know that? And great fishes. It wasn't just Jonah. It's not something novel that you find in the Scripture. Even science verifies that. 
You see, beloved, we like Jacob. We can be like Noah. We can get drunk after we've been tested. But before we get tested, us Israels, we go out and we preach the gospel that bed by righteousness. And then we, like Moses, we can flee. Us Jacobs can flee for our life from Egypt. But then, like Israel, beloved, we can go back to Egypt like Moses did, and we can deliver God's people. And on and on and on it goes. Even if you look at the life of Job, he was a Jacob, and then ultimately he became an Israel. Amen? What am I trying to say to you? What I'm trying to say is this, beloved. Every Christian has a Jacob, an Israel, that lives in him. Every Christian has two natures that lives in him. Every Christian has an old man still since you've been saved and a new man, Israel, that's inside of him. Amen? And so, beloved, in a sense, we're all moral and spiritual schizophrenics, if you want to say it. We're like sociopaths. We're screwballs. Every believer has a split or dual personality. There is something in us that says, do what you ought to do, and then something whispers back, I don't want to do it, and I'm not going to do it. See, Israel is now arguing with Jacob inside of him, amen? You see, beloved, there's something in us that says, I don't want you to go over here. But then uh, Israel steps up and says, you know what, you, uh, I mean, Jacob steps up and says, you, you need to go over there. You'll have so much fun if you go over there. Look what you're giving up if you become Israel. Just look what you're giving up. And you see, beloved, there's something in us that says stop sinning and separate from this evil world system. But old Jacob raises his nasty head and says, don't you do it. You're going to miss out on all the fun. Look what everybody else is doing. And so he tries to suppress Israel. And yet, beloved, this struggle is for your soul. For the eternal destiny of your soul. Which one will you feed? Will it be Jacob? Or will it be Israel, beloved? You know, I'm saying this. We all have a Peter in us. We also have a Cephas, a little stone who finally gets converted and wants to do God's will. We all have a Naomi in us. A godly woman, but she was also a Mara, a woman of bitterness, remember. We all have an Esau in us, but God changed him to Edom, beloved. We all have a Saul in us who becomes a Paul, beloved. We all have a Jacob in us that becomes an Israel. So what am I saying to you this morning? What's the secret to dethroning Jacob the old man and enthroning the new, uh, 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 Israel the new man, beloved, and having victory in the spiritual battle? There's three simple truths. You say, Pastor, this is, I still have 15 minutes. You see that? <laughs> okay. This simple truth, beloved. I'm going to wave a thousand scriptures and just talk to you. How's that? The first simple truth is this here. Is the word of God. How do I make Israel stronger than Jacob? Yes. The word of God. Beloved, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man and woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That word inspiration is the Greek word theonoustos. It means it is God breathed. You want Israel to get stronger? Get some of God's breath in you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, you take old Jacob's food away from him, beloved, and you will end up starving him to death. Beloved, Jacob loves to eat everything in this world, everything except the word of God. He hates the word of God. Don't you feed him pornicate... Uh, uh, Pornography, that's pornication. <laughs> it's a new word. <laughs> Don't you feed him pornography or dirty movies or TV shows, beloved? Because if you do, old Jacob will get stronger than Israel and he'll overcome Israel in you. Don't you feed Jacob dirty magazines. I don't even make them anymore. Hustler or Playboy magazine. Beloved, don't you do that because what will happen is Jacob will really get strong now inside of you. And once those images are deeply imprinted in your subconscious mind, 
That's the hard drive inside of you. Your conscious mind is your uh, software. But once that image is imprinted in your mind, and, and by the way, uh, l- let me say this to you. You know on TV when you see all these commercials about ED and all these other things, beloved, that, which is, to me is so filthy. But you know, one of the great causes of ED is pornography. And one of the reasons for that is because their mate can't match what they're watching on TV, so the dopamine in their brain is not being secreted. No more excitement. And people are stuck to that. But they know what they're doing. They're making money off you. They know you're going to watch that. I won't take that any farther, beloved. I'm saying don't you feed Jacob vulgar and immoral and worldly things because he will grow stronger and he will dominate your thinking and your attitudes. He'll dominate your thoughts. He'll dominate your actions. He'll dominate your beliefs. And he'll dominate your life. The old man Jacob, he wants to rule you. He wants to uh, conquer you. He wants to overcome you, beloved. He wants to govern you. He hates the new man Israel and wants to defeat him. So you need to starve Jacob and feed Israel a healthy, moral, and spiritual diet of God's word, will, and ways, beloved. Israel feeds on the moral and spiritual promises and precepts and uh, 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 principles found in this blessed book right here. Amen. I'm saying if you leave Bible, the Bible unread, Jacob's going to win the spiritual battle in your life. But if you take and read this book, beloved, and I mean Take and read it daily. And I mean read it regularly. And I mean read it repeatedly and often. Then Israel will prevail in you. In Psalm chapter 1, the gateway to the book of Psalm, the Psalter. In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law shall he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Now listen to me, beloved. Jesus talked about chaff in the New Testament. He said he was going to bring the wheat into his garner and get rid of the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now listen to me now. Chaff is the dry stuff from the wheat. They would, when they were winnowing, they'd throw the wheat into the air. The wind would blow the chaff away and the wheat, the berries were heavier. They'd come down. Now chaff burns that quick. It's a flash fire. It's just like little pieces of sawdust dried out. But Jesus said that chaff would be unquenchable fire. What's he talking about? He's talking about the lake of fire, amen? And he's talking about something supernatural and something spiritual here. That chaff, he says, will never burn out with unquenchable fire. You see, beloved, I'm saying this to you. If you constantly and continuously feed your soul and spirit on this book, you will never be defeated by Jacob. He'll he'll never beat you. He'll never overcome you, ladies and gentlemen. You see... He'll lose the spiritual battle to Israel because of the healthy and steady diet of Scripture Israel likes to eat. Now, sometimes you may lose the inning, but you'll never lose the game. Amen? Beloved, sometimes you may lose the round, but hopefully you don't lose the fight. I'm saying sometimes you may lose the battle. But you never want to lose the war. Listen to me, beloved. If you feed the new man, you'll never lose that war. Would you say amen? So do it, beloved. I'm saying give uh, Israel as much food as he wants to eat. In fact, take his dessert and make that the word of God also. Give him seconds and whatever he wants to eat. Let him grow up. Let him grow strong. And you'll only do that not by looking something up on the Internet, but looking something in the word of God. And have the mind of Christ by the Holy Spirit of the living God, the blessed illuminator that dwells inside of us. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, what I'm saying to you simply is this here. If you don't do that, if you don't love the read and study of the Word of God, I can assure you that the Jacob in you will confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, but uh, Israel inside of you that's supposed to be living holy, righteous, and godly will get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Beloved, and ultimately, Jesus said, you're a lukewarm Christian, and I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, that's not uh, something that I want to hear. How about you? You know, with Thanksgiving, 
We all like the turkey, right? Nice big roasted turkey smothered with gravy. Oh, I love it. I love it, right? I, I take the gravy and I go, ah, where's the turkey now? I can mix it up in my stomach. <laughs> Have you ever eaten so much that afterwards you say, I'll never eat again? You want to like this? I ain't ever going to eat again. But by 6 o'clock, you're on the prowl for some fowl. (laughs) Can I have a turkey sandwich, honey, with some gravy and turkey and and, and, uh, cranberry sauce and some stuffing on there? Well, you just ate. No, no, no. I only had a a, a third of the lunch today. (laughs) You see, beloved... Israel needs to feast like that, amen, till it's coming out his ears. <laughs> he needs to feast on the word of God, and Jacob needs to starve to death in our lives. Would you say amen out there? But beloved, you'll starve Israel and strengthen Jacob if you only read your Bible once a week. And you'll starve Israel and you'll strengthen Jacob if you uh, don't uh, start learning the word of God and obeying the word of God. And so that's where we stand before God. Jacob wants to raise his ugly head. And the Bible says that we're to constantly, Israel's to do what to him? Push him down. How many times have you heard me say to you when you get baptized and you bury the old man, put on the new man, the old man's head comes up out of the water wanting to reclaim you? You see, a lot of people are buried alive at baptism, amen? They've not really died to the old man. But God says you need to die to that old man. And you need to feed Israel. Would you say amen out there? And then Jacob will get weaker and defeated and overcome and he'll die. So that's the word of God. That's the simple, first simple secret. The second one is simply this, beloved. Walk with God. The word wrestled in this text is the Hebrew word in verse 24, avak. And it means to grapple with God, contend with him, struggle, tussle with God. Every Jacob must constantly and continuously wrestle with God to be supernaturally changed and transformed by God into an Israel before God to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, that means that when Jacob turned to Israel, he said to God, I will not let thee go till you bless me. And sometimes you have to do that. Lord, I've got a besetting sin. I need your help. I need your victory. I need your spirit. I need your grace. I need your power to overcome this. Oh, Father, rip it out of my mind and rip it out of my heart. Help me, oh God, to put on the whole armor of God that I may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Would you say amen? I won't let you go except thou bless me with thy Holy Spirit, Jacob was saying. I won't let you go unless you bless me with your favor and your goodness, unless you bless me with your character. Unless you bless me with a close and intimate personal relationship with thee so I can daily walk with thee and be like thee and be sanctified like thee. Because I know old Jacob, he loves the world. And old Jacob loves to run with the devil's crowd. And old Jacob loves to revel in sin, beloved, and disobey God. But you know, Israel is filled with the Holy Spirit. Israel in us likes to yield to God. It loves the blessings of God, the presence of God. Submits and surrenders to the authority and lordship of God. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, Paul said this. He said, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And the two are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. And then he goes on to say, if you are walking in the Spirit, you are not under the law with the affections and lusts thereof. So, beloved, you can see he says to us here uh, uh, that we need to not only walk in the Spirit, we need to be led by the Spirit, and Israel needs to obey the Holy Spirit in our life. Would you say amen? Then, beloved, he can defeat Jacob. Then, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, just like Enoch walked with God, he had victory. Noah walked with God, God delivered him. The Bible says uh, uh, about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriots, beloved. They walked with God, and God says, I'm going to build the nation of Israel because of your faith, because of what you did, because they walked with God. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can defeat Jacob. We can conquer and overcome him. So daily, Israel must wrestle with God for power to subdue Jacob. So let's not let uh, be Israel on Sabbath 
And then when you walk out the doors, you're Jacob the rest of the week. I'm coming to church. I want to worship God. Oh, yes, I'll sing hymns to him. You go out the door and you end up being Jacob. Nothing's changed. You know, God changes you through the foolishness of preaching, he says, doesn't he? That's why we need to hear preachers, beloved. Not because I'm preaching to you, but we need to. So I'm saying this, beloved. God wants people to walk with him Sunday through Friday like they did with him on Sabbath. Amen? Let's be Israel at home. Let's be Israel at work. Let's be Israel at school at playing at church. Now, three minutes left. I'll give you my final point. Number one was the first secret, the word of God. Second secret, walk with God. Third secret, the work of God. Simple secret. Those who minister for God, those who serve God, those who work for God, beloved, the Bible says are blessed and they are touched by God. You want to be touched by God? A special anointing on you, an unction of the Holy Spirit come upon you? You say, yes, preacher. I'm saying this. Busy people, busy people, God changes into an Israel. Busy people, beloved, God reforms their life. Busy people, God transforms their life. You say, preacher, I've not had this inner struggle between Jacob and Israel. Let me tell you why. It's probably because you're not born again. The natural man, the unsaved man, only has one nature inside of him, beloved, and that's their fallen nature. Saved people have two natures in them. The Bible says when we get saved, God puts a new man inside of us, already programmed with the law of God, with the power of God, with the Spirit of God inside of us. But it's our will that must decide who takes ascendancy over the throne of our heart and our life. Right? People, they, people think that God's going to force you against your will to do it. That's not true. So, beloved, I'm saying the, mat, the natural man is just a Jacob. A natural man is like, not Naomi, Mara, bitter. The natural man is a damned sinner. Damned sinner, I said, okay. I did say damn sinner. <laughs> so, beloved, to be in Israel, you must be born again. So I want to honestly ask you this morning. <laughs> Are you a Jacob or an Israel? Because <laughs> if you're a Jacob, you're a damned sinner. <laughs> okay. But if you're in Israel, you're a delivered saint. Let's go to the throne of grace before I say something I'm ashamed of. Listen, just for you now.